When the internet came around in the 1990s, few people understood its true potential. Critics dismissed it as a passing fad. Google wasn't yet a word, and social media was a decade away. Fast forward 30 years, and it's hard to imagine life without the internet. From ordering food to our doorstep to sending money to someone on the other side of the world, our days are forever intertwined with the internet. However, the picture is not always so rosy. The digital world has completely invaded our privacy. Nothing we do or even say goes untracked. Not having a private life has become so normal that most of the world doesn't even consider privacy as a basic human right anymore. Yet anarchy has always risen when basic rights are the most oppressed. Time and again, we see attempts of finding out ways to hide from the eyes of Big Brother. One of the earliest and bravest of such attempts was the online dark market Silk Road. Before we dive into the fascinating story of the rise and fall of Silk Road, we'd really appreciate it if you could hit the subscribe button. On this channel, we're dedicated to simplifying the magical world of decrypto and decentralized finance. Your subscriptions allow us to educate a broader audience. Silk Road, the rise of digital anarchy. Ross William Ulbricht a Penn State graduate, was an active contributor on the official Bitcoin forum, Bitcoin Talk. His posts on Bitcoin Talk under the pseudonym Altoid made it clear that he owned a lot of Bitcoins and had made huge profits on them. He dreamt of an online marketplace where people could be able to buy and sell narcotics and other illicit items anonymously and without governmental interference. The birth child of this dream was the Silk Road. The first ever mention of Silk Road occurred on the 27th of January 2011 on another forum called shroomery.org. Under the guise of a curious question, Altoid posted the following advertisement. Hidden in the darkest corners of the internet, Silk Road was everything Ross imagined and more. A black market for peer-to-peer -peer transactions of arms and narcotics. Think eBay, but you get to buy LSD and AK-47s instead of second-hand sneakers. The goal of Silk Road was to instill order and civility without the coercive power of the state. More than a marketplace, it was a revolution. Ross administered the website under the pseudonym Dread Pirate Roberts, or DPR, a clever reference to the Princess Bride, and sought to give a higher meaning to drug deals. The only way is up. Silk Road had modest beginnings. DBR posted some homegrown psychedelic mushrooms at the first items for sale. The idea behind Silk Road was indeed revolutionary. It simplified the process of posting descriptions and pictures of illicit products, offered a system for taking payment, and tackled the broader market challenge of attracting customers to the vendors. Sellers appreciated direct distribution, which eliminated the risk of non-payment and theft of products. Buyers were attracted by Silk Road's similarity to mainstream e-commerce sites and the convenience it offered. All this without ever having to reveal their real identities. What was there to lose? The word began to spread, and a large influx of users joined after an online gossip column, Gawker, did a thread on Silk Road. This thread, however, also garnered attention from the US government. But at the time, they had no way to find the users or the servers of the stealth website. DPR's revolution engine continued gaining steam. By the fall of 2013, Silk Road comprised more than 100,000 users who completed $183 million in sales, earning DPR a whopping $13 million in commissions. This success could largely be contributed to DPR's community-building efforts. Through Silk Road's community forum, participants got to know DPR's ideas and actions. They shared their experiences with various drugs on the Harmption forum and got acquainted with the vendors on the site who lead to repeat purchases. Despite the illegal listings and operations, Silk Road was not lawless. Counterfeit currency, child pornography, assassinations, and stolen personal information were off-limits throughout the duration of the site. To announce policy changes, DPR would run a State of the Road address, modeled after the US President's State of the Union address. A participant in a research study on Silk Road stated, we're a community, and DPR is our president in a sense. Vendors who cheated the customers or sold poor-quality products were banned from the website. New accounts were auctioned away to prevent users from making duplicate accounts. 
superstar vendors could hide their listings using stealth mode. As Silk Road's popularity grew, however, the operations became tougher, and DPR struggled under its weight. But before we explore Silk Road's downfall, it would mean a lot to us if you could smash the like button below. We plan to make a lot more content like this about crypto and DeFi, and your likes help us do that. Alright, back to Ross Ulbricht. The Beginning of the Fall In September 2011, DPR hired his first staff member, Chronic Pain. Silk Road staff, which eventually grew to 10, supported DPR in monitoring user activity and resolving disputes. Meanwhile, the government had started opening accounts on Silk Road. Since all accounts are anonymous, there was no way for DPR to tell which ones were owned by the feds. In January 2012, the Department of Homeland Security got a fender called Digital Inc. to give up his identity, Jacob George. George immediately cooperated with the police, providing them with their first opening into the clandestine site. In March 2012, an interagency task force was formed with the codename Marco Polo. Shortly after, agents created an undercover identity with the screen name of Knob. For DPR, the challenge of protecting the anonymity of Silk Road's participants comprised three essential aspects. He did a good job at two of them, the third led to their fall. Number one, access. Access meant connecting buyers to sellers anonymously. Silk Road could be accessed only via a stealth Tor browser. According to the FBI, using Tor in connection with a virtual private network or VPN makes it practically impossible to locate computers requesting information from websites or those hosting the sites. Number two, transaction. To allow users to exchange money anonymously, DPR set up an escrow mechanism and asked for the transactions to be done in Bitcoin. When buyers made purchases, they deposited Bitcoin into the escrow wallet maintained by Silk Road. Once buyers received the goods, the Bitcoins were released into the seller's account, and DPR took the commission. To hide the blockchain trail, DPR used a Bitcoin tumbler, which sent individual transactions through a series of dummy transactions to disguise the link between buyers and sellers. As a result, no one could use the blockchain to follow the money trail, even if the buyers and the vendors' Bitcoin addresses were both known. Once payment had been made, the final step involved the transportation of goods from the vendor to the buyer. This step was the biggest challenge for DPR, as it required him to rely on the state infrastructure, and despite his best efforts, it was the one where he failed. Shipment To protect the user, DPR issued a Silk Road Seller's Guide. This guide contained advice on how to avoid attracting the attention of postal and customs authorities. Sellers were encouraged to forge fake IDs and passports. Discussion forums were awash in counter-interdiction strategies, from vacuum-sealing packages to business-style printed envelopes. Vendors were also asked to delete the personal information of buyers immediately after shipping the product, but there was no way for DPR to verify if they actually did that. Worse, most of them actually stored buyers' information to use as leverage in case the feds ever caught them. The Downfall An expanding user base brought in an influx of elements that threatened Silk Road's existence. In November 2012, it suffered a massive denial-of-service attack, which shut the site down. DPR was forced to pay out $25,000 to the hacker behind the attack. After the hack, the federal account knob posted a listing for a large amount of cocaine. Nob had built a rapport with DPR, who brokered a deal to sell the cocaine to Chronic Pain. Chronic Pain, or Curtis Green, was arrested as a result and released on bail. Ironically, DPR thought that Green was the one who had betrayed him and asked Nob to have Green executed. The agents compiled and staged Green's death, emailing bloody pictures to DPR. Meanwhile, theft and blackmail were becoming increasingly regular occurrences on Silk Road. DPR worried that his real IP or server address would eventually leak through. In what would be a lucky break for him, Border Patrol agents had intercepted a package containing nine forged driver's licenses bound for Ross Ulbricht's apartment. When confronted at his door, Ross showed the agents his real license with his real name, but declined to answer any other questions about the origins of the documents. While he was the suspect at this point, the task force had not disseminated his name, and the agents left without making an arrest. Ulbricht, 
decided to change apartments but declined to cut and run. Around this time, a user-friendly chemist threatened to disclose the personal information of site participants he had obtained by hacking into the account of a vendor. He showed DPR a sample of the 5,000 usernames and addresses and demanded $500,000 in return for his silence. Frustrated and threatened, DPR contracted a purported hitman to execute friendly chemist. Necessities like this do happen from time to time to a person in my position, he commented. As the FBI began making monthly arrests of Silk Road users, the noose on Ross's neck tightened. On October 1, 2013, he went to the local branch of the San Francisco Library. Unbeknownst to him, federal agents were tracking his every move. Once Ross logged into his encrypted laptop, he received a message from Cirrus, a new moderator whose account had been appropriated by the FBI. To distract Ross, two agents began fighting in the stacks behind him. As Ulbricht turned around to the distraction, one agent swooped in and grabbed his open laptop, while others quickly arrested him. The game was finally over, and Ross Ulbricht was indicted on charges of narcotics conspiracy, money laundering, and solicitation of murder for hire. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Users of Silk Road who visited the site found an FBI emblem over the announcement, this hidden site has been seized. For a business run under the shadows of technological advancement, the method of the arrest of its founder was quite ironic. Poetic justice, maybe. To this date, several believe that Ross Ulbricht's sentence was a miscarriage of justice. A major argument by his defense has been that Ross wasn't directly involved in violent crimes. Most executions he ordered turned out to be fake. The Free Ross Org has raised millions of dollars of funds in an effort to get clemency for Ross. Guilty or not, Ross Ulbricht's case brought massive attention to the darkest corners of the internet. What led to Silk Road's rise also resulted in its ultimate downfall. Ross met the fate that Gorka had so precisely predicted. Silk Road and Bitcoins could herald a black market e-commerce revolution, but anonymity cuts both ways. How long until a DEA agent sets up a fake Silk Road account and starts sending SWAT teams instead of LSD to the addresses she gets? As Silk Road inevitably spills out of the Bitcoin bubble, its drug-swapping utopians will meet a harsh reality no anonymizing network can blur. Making this video was a lot of fun for us and we hope you enjoyed it too. Let us know what you think in the comments below and subscribe to our channel for the most interesting ideas and stories from the world of crypto and the internet.